Welcome to another episode of the Harvest Growth Podcast, focused on helping consumer product companies, inventors, and entrepreneurs harvest the growth potential of their product businesses by teaching cutting-edge marketing strategies and interviewing successful marketers, as well as product marketing experts that share their stories to inspire you to achieve hyper-growth for your own business. I'm your host, John LeClaire, founder and CEO of Harvest Growth. And I believe that if you want to make your product the next household name, you just need to follow the right plan and that even the best products struggle to succeed when they step away from proven strategies that work. And I believe that you can grow profitably, which means you don't need to be a Fortune 500 company or have access to venture capital in order to grow your business. And if you'd like to learn more about what we call the perfect launch process for marketing products, check out harvestgrowth.com. And if you still have questions on how you can implement this process for your business, you'll see a link on our homepage to set up a free consultation with one of our product launch specialists. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Inventors Launchpad Network. I am Carmen Danisco, your host for today's show of the Launchpad. And uh, with me, I have a gentleman I've known for, I'd say, many years. And, you know, we've been trying to get him on the show. He travels a lot. He's always out. He's helping, you know, brands. He's helping products. He's helping people, inventors, to help get their products out there. He's a really great guy. His name is John LeClaire from Harvest Growth. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun today because he has so much in-depth knowledge on what to do with your product when you want to present it that um, we're going to have some fun. So, hey, John, you over there? Let's get you going, man. How's it going, Carmine? Great to hear from you. It's been a long time. I'm so glad we can reconnect again. Yeah, man. It's been so long and I'm awesomely happy to have you on. I think what you do and what you've been doing, you're not just some guy who was they had nothing wrong with a plumber and decided to do what you do, you know, last year. You know, you've been doing this right. a long time. You know what you're doing and nothing wrong with plumbers. I mean, plumbers are great, but, you know, you're such a professional at what you do that does it make it sometimes easier when somebody comes to you and we'll get into what you do. And, you, you know, when somebody comes to you, is it like, yeah, we can help you. You're like, you, you don't even have a question, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, we've been in this business so long. I call it, you know, the business of launching new products in, in various different fashions. And we'll get into exactly what we do today. But we've done it over many, uh, many forms, big companies, small companies, et cetera, for almost 20 years I've been doing this. And so now it's, it's, it's fun. It's, you know, as, as people, inventors, entrepreneurs come to us, we know what products, you know, have a good chance of working, which ones don't, what changes need to be made. And a lot of it just becomes intuitive after being in the business for so many years, as you know, very well, Carmine. Yeah, exactly. And, it's, and sometimes it makes it, I want to say, fun because really when the people walk in your door, you're like, yeah, we can help these guys. And it's not like a question or it's not a worry. And you know you can move them forward in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you just a little bit of my background. I know we'll get into this uh, as we get through the story, but it kind of makes sense with what you're, what you're talking about. Just, you know, I, I love working with inventors and entrepreneurs. I've, I've had a passion since I was a young kid of wanting to be an inventor until I realized that I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't design products. I'm not good at that. That part I don't enjoy. So I finally realized, I mean, 20 years ago now, right, that the side of it that I really enjoy is bringing products to market. It's a different skill set. The inventors, entrepreneurs, their mindset is about creation of something new, identifying problems that need to be solved. And what we do is help them get from that point is, okay, now how do we introduce this to the masses? And, and it certainly is a process. And we'll go over the process that we use as we get through this interview. But it's if you follow that right process, we know we can help. We know we can help them bring their, their products to market in a very successful way. And you know, the, the big difference I would say in the way I like to run my company, really the reason I founded it now, about 13 years ago that this specific company I founded was to help entrepreneurs and inventors launch their products without having to get a license deal. Now, license deals are great. There's a lot of companies out there that broker licenses. And if, if you just want to invent and pass it on, that's perfect, right? That's a great avenue. But for our clients, the ones that choose to work with us, they want to own the product. They want to own the business. And but they just this missing a piece of understanding what to do next, right? So we help them to wade through the waters of bringing a product to market, avoid the missteps and mistakes and confusion that's so easy to get mired down in. So that's why we, that's why I started this company many years ago. And that's really what we've been doing ever since. Yeah. And it's funny the some of the wording that you use, I can relate to because I love that you say you have a process because you know, it's not like, hey, we're, this is the first time we're doing this. And, and over time, you've created this process that you can just drop people in wherever they are, what phase they're in, and you can keep, you know, hit the ground running. It's not like, you know, you're reinventing the wheel when they walk in your office. 
you got it. You got it. And it took a long time. It's not, a, it's not an easy process, I think, to, to come up with. A little bit of my background. So I used to be a public accountant, believe it or not. I, I, I carry the famous moniker of being the only infomercial producer and product launch expert that is a former CPA, I think. So I say that somebody will call me wrong. I'm sure there's somebody else out there, but, but that's where I started. So I was a CPA. I, I realized, hey, that's not really for me long term. I like to create, right? And it was, you know, it's a great career for those that do it, but not for me. So I, I transitioned over into business school. I went to, I got my MBA at the University of Chicago many years ago. And my goal was, okay, now I want to learn how to create to launch products, to invent, to market, et cetera. And so I took all the courses I could in new product development, new product marketing, uh, et cetera. It goes down the list. And what I, what I found at the time was most of the studies that had been done, all the work that had been done by academics was really around big companies, right? So how do big companies bring products to market, which is great. And I actually use that as my experience when I went and did new product work at Kraft Foods for many years. And it was a great learning experience. But what I realized at the end of that is if I don't have two, three, four million dollars behind me, at that point, I didn't know what to do, right? And most inventors, entrepreneurs don't have that, or or even if they do, really shouldn't spend that very quickly. You want to get their product proven out. So from there, I actually, I left Kraft and went to work for a company called Orange Glow International, which people, a lot of people haven't heard of. I see you nodding. You know the company, but it's, it's, it's the OxyClean company, right? So everybody knows OxyClean as a, as a brand, but the company was called Orange Glow, but I, there was a wonderful opportunity to now work with the founders who had literally started the business in a garage, grew it to an amazing success, eventually sold the business off for $325 million. The Apple family, great, great family. And so it was fun to really work at their feet, you know, with, alongside them, really, it, the people that had launched it from the ground up and now launching new products with uh, you know, bigger budgets than a lot of inventors have by that point. But still, it's understanding it's all started in the garage. It's possible for everybody. So I started after that company was sold off is when I started Harvest Growth, my current company. And we now help inventors and we've developed this system over the last 13 years or so, similar to what we used to do at, at Orange Glow OxyClean, but now with smaller budgets, the, the ability for almost anybody to be able to do this, but through a process that's now been proven over hundreds of launches to be very effective. Wow. I mean, it's amazing when I think back to those days with Orange Glow and OxyClean, um, you guys were, I mean, yeah, infomercials were out, but when you guys hit the market with some of those commercials, they were very, very cutting edge, as, as I recall. They were. So uh, there was a couple of differences with Orange Glow, OxyClean back in the day. One, of course, was Billy Mays. You know, may he rest in peace. What a great man he was. And I know he lived not too far from you, Carmine, for, for much of his life. He was a great, great man. And I, I still think one of the reasons that that he was so successful and iconic as a pitch man is because he was genuine. And that, and that came through. You could tell he was energetic. He yelled, he was, you know, kind of seemed very, very energetic in his presentations, but you knew he believed in the products. So that's part of the success story truly is, is Billy Mays behind it. But part of it too was how we were able to parlay the success on TV into retail. That's really what grew the brand before that all the as seen on TV type products for a decade prior to that, were big successes, but and did okay in retail. But really, Oxycon was the first success to now take it. Okay, now we've got this huge engine that drives amazing awareness. How do we now use that to push retail sales? And of course, the rest is history with with the Oxyclean for many years after that. Yeah, and and you know we'll get into some of the process. What I loved what you guys did was that as you drove to retail, you constantly created new products that you could sell on the infomercial so that you could still make money on infomercials, but you were still driving the brand name to retail. So when the customers walked into retail, they still recognize the name. Yeah. So both processes, the infomercial and retail were happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very astute of you actually to, to, to recognize that a lot of people don't, they think that the infomercial started and kept on going the same with Billy Mays for years. But really, as you said, once you get into retail and everybody knows you're in every Walmart in America, every target, every grocery store, they're not going to buy that same product on TV anymore. So what you we used to be able to sell was a, uh, it was a two and a half pound tub for $40 back in the day on TV. Once you get to Walmart, that price goes way down, of course, right? And so that product, it changed, right? We still make good margin on it, et cetera. But you're right. We, you have to, on TV and now digital, right? So now what used to be only TV for many, many years, now you can do something similar on digital platforms, Facebook and Instagram, still through the power of video. And that coincides with TV. And sometimes it's just digital and that can work very well too to, to really drive awareness, et cetera. But it's got to be innovation. If you're showing something, 
marketing, a product, a demonstration, whatever it might be, and it's not new and different, people stop paying attention. Or they assume, ah, oh, you know, that's cool, but I'll go buy it in retail or whatever. And, and now all of a sudden your advertising is no longer paying for itself because you're not getting the, what we used to say, the phones to ring, right? Now it's surprisingly enough, people still phone yeah. in orders, right? But most of it's, of course, over the web and, and uh, even over Facebook and Instagram through retargeting, et cetera, and other means. Yeah. No, it's awesome, man. And just on a side note, you know, I met um, Billy Mays a couple of times and I always, when I first met him, I expected him to be like, Hey, <laughs> you know, but he was like, such a quiet, like he, his, his persona on camera was, was a little different. He wasn't faking or anything, but it was just, I thought he would just be louder and, and crazier, but you know, he's just a great guy. <laughs> yeah. He's super nice. And, and I, not, yeah, not soft spoken, but not the same yelling that you see and being on set with them. It, it gives you a total different sense. We probably did 20, 25 videos together or so. And, and once those cameras come on, yell, action is yelled, his, he changes his persona. It's not, it's still the same person, right? But it's just, he's projecting his voice, right? And getting your attention. That's one of the things that, that made him so lovable and it really made it work so well. Yeah, awesome, man. So, so as you know, um, I know you've been listening to the podcast for a little while. Um, our listening base is mostly inventors, entrepreneurs. Uh, some of them are successful. They're selling. Some of them are in different phases of their products uh, as entrepreneurs and things like that. So how does what you do, you know, I don't want them to think that, man, I, I can't do that. You know, why is he even on the show? Because I love the way you have, I don't want to say packages, you're able to really fit what you do into almost any budget, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and actually I'm a big believer in education. So I like to be on podcast. So thank, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your show, Carmine. It's, I love being in front of your audience and, and of course, reconnecting with you again after so many years. So this is great. And it's, it's what I love to do is to educate. And a lot of, of, a lot of the work I do is, is free. We do a lot of blog posts and articles and video trainings and things like that, that we want to get the word out and help people to launch products. And, you know, some people have a very limited budget and they want to do it on their own. And you know, we want to help them at least get as far as they can, right? Through instruction. And I'll tell you, you know, a kind of a system we use that, that can be helpful for that. For others that need a little bit more help uh, and, you know, have a little bit of budget to do it, it doesn't have to cost what it used to be. Like, you know, years ago, if you did a TV launch, you know, even 20 years ago, uh, it would cost at least $100,000, $200,000 and on up, right? Very, very expensive to, to get involved. Now with the change in the digital landscape, it's, you know, it's still, there's a, a cost to it, but it's significantly lower cost to be able to get started. So a lot of our clients, for example, will start with advertising on Facebook and Instagram. We'll do a simpler video than we might do for national TV and then prove out the concept. But in the meantime, it's not just a test, right? We're also getting revenue in. They use that to then fund a bigger launch later on, potentially going to TV, other platforms, et cetera. So starting small, but in that test, really bringing in revenue. And so let me teach you, you know, your audience one kind of a quick overview of what we call the perfect launch process. So it's this process that we've developed over the last uh, 13 years and really before that with my education and big company background, et cetera. But it's, it's kind of a combination or culmination of all that I've learned and all that I've done and all the many launches we've done over the years. Again, we call it the perfect launch approach because it's something that can be dropped in on almost any consumer product, which is really what we do. We're not, not really a business to business marketer, but a, we sell consumer products, right? But it could be a $10 item. It could be a thousand dollar item and it, you know, almost any category. It's a process that works for, for everybody. So it's, it's really three key steps. So it's, we call it prepare, produce, and then profit. So I'll go over it kind of you know quickly today and we've got more information on our website at harvestgrowth.com and other, you know, we can feel free to call us anytime at our, at our office. There's a link on our website. They can go in and meet with one of our product launch specialists to get a lot more detail, you know, specific advice. But, but the preparation part is, is one that I view as maybe the most important and, and often left out, especially with new inventors, new entrepreneurs that think they just have to either get to market or go slowly, right? So some get stuck in the patenting process, which is important, right? So on many categories, it's good to have a patent, but you don't want to spend all your money and then be stuck and not be able to market the product. So this other piece of what we call preparation is it's essentially testing. So a big part of it is market research. So we, we do a specific way of surveying consumers. There's a battery of questions that we ask to understand how likely are they to purchase the product? What should we price it at? What color should it be? Things like that really just to prove out the concept. And then also something about features and benefits. And I know you've talked about this with some of your other guests over the years, but it's features are essentially the facts of a product, right? Color, size, descriptions, et cetera. Benefits is how it helps you, right? So it's the, it's the benefit language that's used. So getting both of those and understanding 
each product, what's most important through research. And what we find is, you know, back in my craft foods days, we would spend six figures, often $200,000 or more on market research. It's crazy, mm-hmm. right? So it's, and, you know, inventors can't or shouldn't do that, right? Even if you have unlimited pocketbooks, there's no need anymore to do that. Again, big companies are just different, but for a small company, it it's, can be almost free. You know, it's, it's in the hundreds of dollars kind of thing to do it right. Uh, one of these types of surveys on your own, right? To ask these questions and, and get these answers. But what you do is now you avoid tens of thousands of dollars in mistakes, right? So if you go to market the wrong way, you adjust, you tweak, you modify, it's just money to that, right? It, there's a cost to that. So it's getting that testing done up front is, is such a crucial step. The other piece of it, I'd say, so there's market research. We talk to consumers. The other piece of it is, is now looking at the competition. So I, I had an old uh, boss many years ago. I used, to, I used to work with it. She used a phrase that I, I've, I've loved and used many times called borrow with pride, right? So I, I tell this to all my employees and with new, new uh, clients we work with. So this is not about copying your competition, right? But it's about getting learnings in, in two ways from their wins and their losses, right? So we learn if they're doing something right, it's okay to get some learns like, hey, this is the way they talk about their product. Like, okay, that's something I hadn't thought about. Let me, you know, not copy that, but learn from that. And maybe this is a type of feature or benefit that I should talk about in my messaging. But then also look for losses or what I call opportunities. So if there's something either they're not talking about or their product doesn't include that makes what makes your product better when you take it to market, look for that in this in this competitive analysis. And then beyond that, you know, kind of I would say high level and analysis of competitors through Google searches through viewing their products on Amazon, looking at their website, their retail packaging, et cetera. Beyond that, there's a lot of tools that we use where we can now analyze, okay, what are they using as keyword uh, tools, right? So what keywords are they using on Google, on Amazon? So behind the scenes stuff that with some software tools we have access to, we know exactly some of this quote unquote secrets that they're doing and we can, again, learn from those. So these, those are the two components of prepare, I'd say, is the consumer research and then the category review or analysis it gets out there. And then the next step is, before you go, oh, go ahead. Before you go to the next step, that's, yeah. I mean, I am, and, I, and this is awesome. I'm like writing all this down. Um, a lot of times, and I'm, I'm glad to do this, a lot of our inventors and, and myself sometimes, I'm kind of scared to ask people if they like my product or if they like the color, or if they like things, because I don't want negative feedback. But what you're saying is leave it up to someone else probably if I'm too emotionally attached to it, right? Absolutely. I, I love that you brought that up. Thank you. Because what happens oftentimes is we get that reaction in a, in a survey, for example, that A, either people hate the product or not, don't like it in its current form. So I, there's two ways to take that answer. Well, a three, I guess. One is you could ignore it, right? Which, is, which we see happen sometimes. You get, you're so emotionally involved and attached to your product, you just ignore any feedback that comes in. Don't take that road, right? But the, the two right ways to approach it, one is to, okay, maybe I should stop and look for another product, right? If the feedback is bad enough, like, Maybe, maybe it's not as unique as I thought, like, hey, I love this product, but there's something already out there that's just as good or better. And, and that's, you know, you'd rather learn that up front and move on to something else that's going to be your big home run as opposed to pushing something that's going to you know, maybe never work or never, you know, to the extent that you'd hope it to. But the second way is often missed. The second way is to adjust, right? So if you've got a product and you get some feedback, hey, that the response is low, people, the, what we call purchase intent score is low, you can change it, right? So what do you change in your messaging? Maybe your pricing, maybe add some features that will bring more important benefits to solve a different problem. So it's, it's getting those learnings and adapting. I like that. You can make changes. Like, so you, it gives you the ability before you go spend a lot of money and go to market, you're changing for what the public or your target market wants. Absolutely. Yeah. So adjust and optimize throughout the process. And this is something that it comes not just to the product, but to your marketing. So down the road, as you actually start to bring this to market, the same thing happens. You may see some poor or lower than expected results early on, and that's okay. Some of the biggest home runs that we've worked with, the first few weeks or even months sometimes are struggling, right? They're not making money because we're testing, tweaking, optimizing until you turn that corner. So it's sometimes it's not just the product, but the way you talk about it. It's the messaging, it's the pricing, it's really the marketing approach that you take. The nice thing is once you dial that in, once you get it optimized, now you can grow it and scale it very quickly. And it's, it's uh, predictable and scalable are the words we like to use, right? So it's, you get that dialed in. Now you can just keep doing more and more behind, you know, marketing the same channels with the same messaging to the same platform, but in a bigger way. And that's really how you grow your business. Cool. Yeah. And what I like about it is because you have the experience, you know, 
you're kind of not you're kind of warning or or letting the customer know how it's going to go. You're going to be like, listen, we're going to start here, and yeah, we're not going to have a lot of sales till we launch, till we do this, till we make these tweaks, till we change it. You know, because a lot of people are like, as soon as you put it out there, like, you know, I didn't make a million dollars last week, you know, and they want to give up. But the way that you're explaining it, you know, have a process, you're letting them know, hey, listen, you know, this is how it works, you know, and I think that really helps people be more relaxed and calm and expect the unexpected kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, I mean, that kind of takes me into the next step of our process. So after that, for the preparation piece, now it's time to what we call produce, which really means, okay, now we've got to produce our marketing materials, right? So for us, oftentimes that's video. Video marketing is, is still the most efficient, powerful form of marketing that's out there for almost every product category. So we produce, and we do a lot of this in-house. We've been doing it for many years, no national TV ads, but we do a lot of digital Facebook, Instagram, website videos as well. So it's, it's about producing that, but taking your learnings from this first step, this market research, not just on the product, but on the messaging, right? So how do we script the right video or videos, right? Because you're going to do different formats typically for Facebook and Instagram and all this kind of stuff, making sure that you've got the right approach. So producing the video and then also producing the ad the ads themselves, right? So on TV, the video is kind of it, right? So you, you put it up on TV, it's the commercial, that's what you get. And, and that's, you're driving people to your website. Of course, you've got messaging, copy on the website, et cetera. In a Facebook or Instagram ad, you've got the video. And many times, you know, even in the most successful campaigns, people may watch three, four, five seconds of the video and then click. If you get their attention, you get to the website, that's okay. They can watch the rest of the video once they get to the site or, or read copy that's you know similar to what we're saying. But there's another piece to it. So it's called ad copy, right? So above and below, if you've, you know, if you're, for those of your listeners that have been on Facebook and Instagram, most of them, I assume, um, is, is you look at the copy, the written copy above and below these sponsored videos. So you, it's a quick sentence, often a testimonial or, or a quick feature and benefit. And it's identifying those. And it's amazing how the same video can have a different sentence above it and completely different results. So it's getting that messaging just right, dialed in, but again, doing it from your learnings that you got in, in stage one, that preparation phase, your research, understanding your audience, it makes that process much easier. And then getting to the website, whether it's from TV or from digital platforms like Facebook or Instagram, making sure that those copy points are also included on the website as well. So it's just, it's making, making it consistent throughout, finding out what your market, your target market cares about, and then talking to them in the right way. And the rest is a lot easier, which, so the last step is the easiest is profit, right? So it, it, we call it the easiest, but it's, you know, once you've dialed everything in, in the first two stages, now it's just about repeating and scaling, right? So it's, it's about, okay, now I've got this working, now I just scale up my spend. So for example, we start off with maybe $500 a week and you know, the first spend test on Facebook and Instagram, for example, right? And if that works, we're generating two, three, four times that in revenue. Great. Pour some of that back into the business, scale it up, and it becomes a repeatable business. The, the interesting thing about this process is if you start to hit a, a snag or your, your growth starts to be stalled at some certain point, you can go back through this process again. Okay, now it's about, okay, okay, I've got my marketing. It's, it's stopping working after a year or two years, whatever it might be. Let me go through again the same process, prepare, produce, profit, right? So research again, okay, what more learnings can I get to maybe target a secondary audience and what do they want to hear and what's the messaging they want to get and then adjust the marketing messaging accordingly to, as we target them. So it's going through that process over and over and over again in a repeated fashion is how to best grow your business for the long term. And that's kind of what you've done with all of these brands, all of these products. You know, if people go out to harvestgrowth.com, they'll see the products that you work with. You know, you've built them over time. I mean, you didn't take this one product. You took the product, you ran it through this process. As it slowed down, you went back, you ran another or updated it, or it was a different version. Yep. And that's why having somebody like you to bolt on with that experience it's not just about making a video, guys. All my, all my listeners out there, it's not just about making video. It's so much more to it, right? I mean, you're bolting on so many things, but it's not scary or it's not um, something that you should shy away from. You just need to have the right process. Exactly. And there's, and there's really three you can change beyond. So sometimes it's creating a whole new video. Sometimes it's, like you said, bringing out an additional product or you know, the deluxe version or the newer, you know, new and improved. But it's not always that. Sometimes it's, it's really pulling one of these other three levers. And there's really, it's, it's the offer, it's the audience or the message. So those three levers you can pull, you can now after a year, things have stalled out. Well, we can change the offer. Maybe we decrease the price. Now we give free shipping or now we 
buy two, get one free, or add in something with it, or potentially change the product as well, right? So that's the offer you can change. The, the off or the audience rather is who we're talking to now on TV. That's the stations we choose. So if we had previously were targeting this certain version of our ad with a female audience aged 45 plus, for example, right? So now let's okay, that one's kind of saturated. Now, how do we target males 45 plus or, or whatever it might be depending on the product. So talking to the audience now on Facebook and Instagram, you can get much more laser dialed in on exact audiences, exact people really. Right. So on TV stations, it's, types of people. It's, you know, it's an average of maybe this station is on average women 45 plus, but you know, you and I might watch it too, right there. We're, we're in that mix on Facebook. You can target only women within a certain age bracket, for example, or and what we do is they have something called lookalike audiences where if you know anyone who's familiar with Facebook is probably familiar with this to some extent. Now it's a very focused. It's not just about age, but it's about people that are like the buyers of your product, right? They're very similar in, in certain psychographics, right? So they're now all of a sudden we can get this laser focused audience and it just improves, improves over time. And that's where we see ROIs or return on investment or profitability really go up over the course of a campaign because we can laser focus and dial these in. And the last piece is the messaging, which we've talked about. So it's, it's changing the video. It's changing the ad copy. It's really how you talk about it, maybe changing the website, but focusing on those three levers, you can further enhance your campaign or correct a campaign that might be going off course. You know, and 90% of those things that you just spoke about, I mean, are things that can be changed fairly quickly. You know, and I don't want to say it's easy. I don't like that word, but because you're ready for it, it's digital. It can be changed. And the other part that I love is that testing these things, you know, from the early 2000s to now, um, it's so nice to be able to test ad copy, test ads, test different things so quickly and get feedback. I know that when I have an idea, I think it's the greatest idea in the world. I automatically think this is my market. And nine times out of 10, I am totally wrong on who I think the market yeah. is. And true. And, you know, and frankly, even with research, right? So research, I would say, puts us in the right direction. But, it's, but we still want to fine tune that through actual results or the actual launch. And it's, what I love about the, the kind of new frontier of marketing, of really direct response marketing of the last several years, is it really has made this testing process faster, easier, and cheaper. You know, I think back to my craft foods days. So my first true career in launching new products, we would spend, as I mentioned before, two to $3 million on any new product launch. But you also, the harder part is you wait, right? We did a campaign and on a, a new honey made uh, line of snacks, or I, I launched uh, part of the 100 calorie snack packs for Nabisco back in the day as well as was part of Kraft Foods. And you'd wait, right? So you create, do all this work up front, a lot of market research, dollars in advertising, and you wait for months before you have any idea if it's working or not. What I loved about my transition into in the infomercial space, direct response TV is now all of a sudden that, that period of a, a lot of money, right? But also a lot of time to prove out. Now we can put something on TV in a week when we have results back. And then we, we make tweaks and changes and go on air for another week on national TV and adjust that. But now that's changed. Now on, on Facebook and on Instagram specifically, we're still talking directly to the consumer, still marketing directly to them, but we get responses back in a day or immediately, right? We can, we can change it every single day. We can do these split tests where we got two different websites with different offers and you're getting these answers back much more quickly. So even for our, our bigger clients that are going to TV, because TV still works, right? It's TV infomercials are still a, a, the best way to scale a business and really drive retail. So a lot of our clients end up going there, but, but even those that have very deep pockets, we still start with the digital approach because we can test, tweak, change, modify, improve back and forth very, you know, almost constantly through the process, get it dialed in and then go to TV. So we're, we're saving a lot of time and a lot of money in the, in the long term. You know, that must be so much fun. I, and again, I know it's not a, you know, you're, it's a, it's a, it's a work business and it's serious business, but to see those, whether your idea works or not, and being able to change that or change one word or change an ad and actually see it work so quickly, uh, it must be just so much fun to say, okay, this is it. We hit it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then you just blow it out. It's, it's exhilarating. So, I, you know, I, as I mentioned before, I'm an inventor at heart. I'm just not a good inventor, right? I don't, I don't know how to, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how to make products, right? But I, I, that's my passion, right? So I, I share the passion with our clients that are inventors and entrepreneurs on helping them bring their products to market. So we really, you know, we only work with people we like and products we like that we believe in. You know, there are good products we turn away just simply because we don't have the passion for it because it's such an important part of what we do, right? But I, you're, you're exactly right. It's a lot of fun because I share that passion 
so when they have a success, I feel it too, right? I, it's it's my success. I, sh- I mean, it's theirs, right? They own it, but but I get to share a part of that and that emotional reaction with them, and and it is so fun. And what I what I've loved to see is on the TV side of the business, you know, the infomercial side of the business. For years, it was maybe a you know ten percent success rate as an industry, right? So ours was higher because we use this this whole process, but but it was tough. And even my craft foods days, you'd spend two to three million dollars, ten percent success rate. Most products fail, right? It's just the nature of your products. What I love about this new frontier, this new landscape of digital marketing to launch a product is our success, our internal success rate has gone up 10 times. So our, our, we have 10 times more success now than we did even just a few years ago with TV, even though we were, you know, we were successful compared to the industry before, but now it's, it's things have changed. And I love that because it's, I mean, it's always, we, I share that passion. So there are downs when a product doesn't work, right? It's, it's frustrating and but now what I love about it is, as you mentioned, you can now dial it in. So even if the first week it's, eh, I'm kind of down and frustrated, like, you know, what do we do to fix this? Well, there are things we can do and we can go out there and make tweaks and changes. Then week two or week three, it turns around, it becomes a success, a home run. It's so invigorating. It, it's absolutely exciting. And I love to share that excitement with the inventors and entrepreneurs we work with. Yeah, I could tell, man. I, I mean, I could tell it's, you're having fun doing it and being able to, as technology evolves, as you know, the web evolves, having those weapons in your arsenal to just make things better. Um, you don't have to be some supercomputer geek, obviously, you know, but, but you just have to use those tools in the right way. Agreed. Exactly. So it's just, it's understanding the process, dialing in the process in the right way. And, and, you know, again, we, we like to teach the process. We can't teach everything we do because it's, you know, it changes every day, all, all that kind of stuff, right? But the basics, so enough that you know, people can try this on their own, et cetera. But we obviously, of course, we'd love to work with, with these people on, on their products. Um, and, and we can walk th- them through the process, hold their hand through the process and teach them these nuances, but really help them to take advantage of them so they can have success with their business. Yeah, enough to know for all you listeners, enough to know that you really don't want to do this on your own. <laughs> and John's not saying that because, you know, he wants you to try it or look into it. But if you want to be successful, you have to have a team. There's, there's just no doubt about it. But, you know, obviously know enough about it. And that's what I love about John. What you're doing is you're educating enough so that people can try certain things, or try certain aspects, and they can get a good idea. And at some point, if they come to you, you'll know that they're a little bit more educated and knowledgeable. It's easier to move them forward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and one of the things we teach in a lot of the content we write is to how to do these market research tests, right? So if they start off on their own, even just to see if it's a good idea, right? So if they want to start in that process and they come back like, hey, we got some good results on this. Like now we want some help. Awesome, right? So it's, and we might redo the market research because there's a way that we do it, right? Just to prepare the campaign. But, but, uh, but it's enough to at least get that, that early indication of, hey, is, which of these fried products that I've got in my head should I, what should I work on, right? So it's a, it's a good focus to work on. Yeah, yeah. So I just got a question come in from from uh, from our studio, from our waiting room area, the conference room. We broadcast our show. Um, Do most of the clients that come to you have product or a certain amount of inventory or or just maybe a few hundred units or whatever? Do they need to have product or is it better to obviously you can do dry tests, whatever. But what's the best way to do it? Yeah. So most of the clients that we work with at least have have product almost ready at least, right? So our process takes typically two to three months. So we we coach them that, okay, you want to have inventory at least two to three months away from today, right? And we do need, because we're shooting video, usually we need uh, a physical sample that we can shoot a video with and prepare a website, take product photography, but you don't need tens of thousands of units of inventory. You can get away with a few hundred, depending on the price points and that kind of thing. But relatively small levels of inventory to start, right? Prove this out. Because even again, even if you have deep pockets behind this, when we launch the campaign, you may find out that, man, I wish I would have added this feature to it. So the last thing you want is to have 10,000 units of something that you wish were a little bit better. So start off small. You can always get more inventory replenishment. And with direct response marketing, meaning you're marketing directly to the consumer, you can start and stop it. So if you if you hit a snag, like, hey, we really want to need to change this, you can turn off your marketing campaign and come back to it later on. So if you need to adjust. Now, that being said, we, we do, as you mentioned, there's dry testing, right? So it's kind of like, Kickstarter or, you know, crowdfunding campaigns, you can do pre-order campaigns with a Shopify website, for example. So we have a client we are just brand new working with that it's very expensive to make the molds for their particular product. And their goal, ultimately, they want to get a license deal, but they want to prove the concept out, that there's sales behind us. They want to start that process. So what they're doing is we're actually, we don't have any sample of the product. It's very expensive even to make a sample. So we're doing an animated video for them. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really cool product that, that solves a, an everyday problem. You know, it's, it's kind of confidential at this point, but I'll, you know, 
when, when the story comes out, we'll sh- certainly share with you and your audience. It's super cool, but it's, we can show that in animation now and bring people to the site, collect pre-orders. So that's an option. I would say most of, you know, 90% of the work we do, obviously you're selling, you've got inventory, you ship it out. Um, with Shopify websites nowadays, uh, a lot, some of our clients even start shipping on their own because you literally, the orders come in, you click a button, it prints out a thing, clap it on a box and you're, and you're good to go. So it makes it really easy. Once you get good volumes, then you hire a, a fulfillment house, at least, you know, a, a third party logistics, they call it. They're inexpensive. It's not expensive to do, but uh, that's down the road. So it's, you can start a lot of this. You can start very simply and easily, easily on your own. Yeah. I love, you know, the Shopify platform. You're exactly right. I agree. It's a, it's a great platform. To, to utilize, like you said, not only just to start off, but I've seen some, some pretty large companies running on Shopify. Yeah, absolutely. We have, we have clients that are in tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue and still using a Shopify platform. There's, you know, there's pros and cons. The heart, it's not as flexible as some platforms, but it is something, you know, an inventor and entrepreneur can do on their own, right? They can make tweaks, adjustments, changes to it pretty relatively easy. You don't have to be a coder for it. So there's some, some limitations, but the other nice thing is so much of what we do is about data. So coming back from our TV days, you want to see, again, who's buying, what stations are working on, that kind of stuff. Now on Facebook and Instagram, we want to see what audience is buying, what ads working, et cetera. And when you have a, a good website, and Shopify is not the only platform that does this, but they're one of the best ones where you can connect them really successfully and effectively to Facebook and Instagram so that you're not losing that data. So for example, when you launch a product on Amazon, you lose all that because it's not your website, right? So when you, and Amazon's a great tool. We use it for almost all our clients. We want to get there eventually, but in the, to get learnings, it's a difficult platform to use for a new and different product, especially that's, you know, people aren't searching for is because you go to Amazon, no matter if we send them to Amazon from a Facebook ad, we don't know which ad they saw, who bought all that kind of stuff. So with Shopify websites, you get all of that data, you get all those learnings. And then, you know, some people are going to go over to Amazon. We kind of use it as a secondary vehicle in the very beginning because we want to get learnings, which we get on Shopify and then have Amazon, for example, as a secondary platform. Cause I'm a big Amazon shopper. When I see an ad, that's where I go first. There's a lot of people like me, right? So you want to have that availability, but you want to try to keep as much, as many people as you can on the, on the site itself. Again, purely for data in those early days, especially. Yeah. Yeah. It's a data driven world. Like you said, uh, you want that information. Especially if you're trying to help your clients out, you want to have that information. So it's, uh, it's very super important. Um, so yeah, so we're running a little bit low on time. I know you have a book out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, so I, I wrote a book a few years ago, actually, called Sell on TV. So it's kind of one of the Bibles of direct response TV. And I wrote it in a fashion of education, really. So if, if TV is the route that you want to go, then it's a great book to get started, just to understand how it all works. And actually, you can get a free copy of it on our website. So if you go to harvestgrowth.com, it's harvest, H-A-R-V-E-S-T, growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, dot com. They're down at the bottom of our homepage. There's a link you can click and get a free copy. It's a PDF version of the Selling TV book, or you can get it on Amazon and other platforms as well. But the intent of that book and really what it's done for us over the years is really just to give you, okay, here are the steps to follow if you want to launch a, an infomercial campaign, whether you hire us or not, but just to make sure you avoid those stumbling blocks. And I've got another book in the works now on, on the digital platform because we're doing so much more on that. But a lot of those, even if, even if digital is your way to go, it's, it's a great book on on videos, right? So I understand what videos tenants uh, to use as you launch a campaign to make sure that you're going to be successful as you go out. So yeah, thanks for, for the plug on the book as it were, but again, it's free. So if you want to go to our website at harvestgrowth.com, you can download a free version. Yeah. And well, that's kind of why I mentioned it too, because you do give it away. It just shows that you're really just pushing education. I mean, you want potential clients or people that are looking to do this to be successful. And that's what I love about it is that, you know, you're not saying here, you know, buy my book. I mean, obviously if you want the actual version, you could buy it, but you're giving it away, which is awesome. It's, it's crazy how, you know, years ago when we first met, um, the camera was certain seemed like it was the most important piece of equipment. Now it just seems like there's so many little nuances and little things that the camera is just such a small little piece, right? It is. Yeah, it's funny. So we, we of course have, you know, one of the expensive cameras, or whatever, but you can get away with the quality of even a phone for some videos. If you're starting off with a product video, it's, you, you can have good quality. You know, there's some features you can't do. You can't change lighting as well. You can't do what we call creep zooms. And a lot of those things are going to make the video feel that much more premium, but the quality of the image is very similar, even from a, from a iPhone or a, you know, Samsung Galaxy or that kind of thing. So it's as a starting point, it's an okay place to be um, and you know, eventually move on to a more professional video. The more important part 
frankly, is the scripting, right? It's, it's the messaging. It's how you're talking about the product, what you're saying. Those elements are becoming more important because it's on a level playing field on the actual visuals, right? And there's some certain tricks that we do to make it look even more premium, but the real value we provide for our clients, for example, is, is the, is a script because that makes all the difference in the world. The way you talk about this is what's going to make it go viral, make it, convert so people aren't just watching but they're getting to your website that they're interested in purchasing that they're kind of pre-sold on on the product before they even get there yeah that's cool man so so we're closing up um is and and you don't have to name names is there um as you look back over your career is this is there a certain shoot or commercial or something that you did with uh with a client or something that just sticks out in your mind whether it was bad or good um and you get any, you don't have to name names but is there something that you know you just remember that as being like something that sticks out yeah, you know, it's interesting. A great question to bring up. I'll, I'll, I'll mention the names. We have a recent client. It's uh, in the last six months or so, a product called Camp Made, C-A-M-P-M-A-I-D. And it's a, uh, for anybody in the audience, it's a Dutch oven user. It's not for everybody, right? But if you're a camper, a Dutch oven cooker, especially in the outdoors, but also works indoors, it's kind of like a Swiss army knife of, of products for a Dutch oven. So they also sell Dutch ovens, but they're more about the tools that go with it, right? So we're taking off lids to turn your Dutch oven into a pizza oven, to a steamer, to a roaster, to a smoker, to a grill, all this kind of stuff. So you go to the website, you know, Camp Made, if you want to learn more about the product itself. But but the shoot was, it's very memorable because it, to this day in 13 years of doing this, probably the most difficult shoot I've ever done. The client is fantastic. So I hope if they're listening to this, I'm being you know, totally upfront, but they're awesome to work with. I love them. Family owned, it's a father and daughter that run this business and they're awesome to work with. So the, the difficulty on this shoot is, is, as you can imagine, you've got to now cook something, prepare it. It can take 45 minutes to get heated up. So you get that perfect steam shot, right? And we're doing that over and over and over again. I think 20 or 25 different recipes over the course of two days. So it was a lot of work to get that done. But it, you know, shoots can be hard to do them right, right? It's not as easy. You, know, you look at a video and that video ended up being two minutes. Out of two days of work, plus a lot of beyond that even, right? But two primary days of shooting, 10 hours a day, two days solid to get two minutes of footage right at the end of the day. And it's working really well. They're selling on TV now. They're, they're selling on Facebook and Instagram. So it's great to see their success and, and they're such good people and the product's fantastic. But to me, that stands out. It's, it's a good example of it can be hard, this preparation phase of a business, getting things ready. But doing it right is so important, right? We, sit, we, we could have gone out there with an iPhone and shot really quick videos on just, hey, here's the product. Here's what it looks like, you know, in, I don't know, two hours, right? And had a okay video, but it wouldn't have sold, right? So it, it was worth going through that extra effort. And I, that's my advice to every inventor and entrepreneur out there is spend some time on this upfront piece, right? Whether it's your marketing collateral or getting the product just right and dialed in is, you know, it's, it doesn't have to take months or years, right? On whatever stage you're at but be careful with it, right? Be studious with what you're doing and make sure you're doing each step of the process, right? And if you need some help along the way with, you know, different vendors, like with a patent, for, we don't do anything with patents, right? So we always advise if you know, you're getting a patent, make sure you work with somebody that knows what they're doing, right? It's, it's, it's going to make it the process shorter, but it's going to get it right too. And just every step of the way, make sure you you're either know what you're doing or working with somebody that can help you. And, and it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. Each of these vendors, there are good and bad ones and there are expensive and inexpensive ones. And it's not always the expensive ones that are the best ones. So it's, you know, just look around and find out what's the right fit for you. Yeah, I agree, man. I think it's great, John, that you say that uh, it's not easy. Um, professionals like yourself, it takes time to get the right shot. It takes time. You know, when people see the videos that you create, they're like, oh, John, make me a video. They think you're just going to, you know, whip it up. But, you know, it's, it's, it takes time because, you know, today's, with today's high-definition cameras, people expect this high level of quality when you're, when you're pushing a product like that. And I, I think that, like you said, if, if you're shooting with an iPhone, you can do it. But if you say to yourself, that's okay, then it's not good enough. Yeah, you're right. And, and uh, you know, I'd love to be back on the show some other time and talk about, we have some tenants of video. I don't have time to go into today, but one of the tenants of doing a good video is credibility. And if, and, and one of the pieces of credibility is that premium look and feel. So it doesn't look like, I always say like, it's okay for your audience, you know, as an inventor, right? Your, your target market to know that you invented your product in a garage but they don't want to feel like you're still making it in a garage, right? So they want to understand that what they're getting is high quality. And, and part of that's going to come out in how you present yourself with your video, with your website and other materials to really make sure it looks premium. It looks like something they can trust. Yeah, awesome, man. And listen, this is usually a half hour show. We can keep going. I mean, this could be turned into a three hour show. I'd love for you to come back on. I think that uh, as we spoke about before we started filming, um, 
this is super needed for not only an inventor, even business owners, for anyone who has a product, a service, an inventor who's looking, even if you're looking for investment money, creating a good video, explainer video, this is so important. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before we started, I said, this is going to be a, a great lead in to hopefully we'll do some more shows because I tell you, John, this is great. I know all of our listeners right now are going, man, they're writing this down like crazy. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate it. As I mentioned, the time to be on the show. I love to teach. I love to educate and get the word out on how to launch products. I'm a huge believer in the power of innovation really to drive our country and our world, right? So if we can help inventors and entrepreneurs to be more successful, there's a million great ideas out there that are struggling along because they don't know how to bring them to us. They don't know how to bring them to market. So just getting that part of the process right, if we can help educate in any way. And I'll mention, if you go to our website, one of the great tools I'll offer, you know, get our free book, of course. But so go to Harvest Growth, Harvest growth.com. There's a link on the bottom. You can connect and actually set an appointment up to speak with one of our product launch specialists. So a member of our team can actually answer specific questions. So, you know, the book is meant to be great to give you some direction, advice, et cetera. But if you've got specific questions on your product that we can just answer, you know, let us know, go ahead and set up one of those free consultations. There's no cost for it. And they'll be glad to walk you through. Um, I joined some of those calls, but we have our team that's very well versed. We've all been here doing this for a long time and launched hundreds of products together. So they know what they're talking about as well. And, and, uh, you know, again, we'd love to help out wherever we can. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, all of us, our listeners, myself, all of our team, we really appreciate any information, especially, um, giving out the free consultations. Huge. I mean, that is taking time out of your guys day, but it's beneficial for our listeners. They want to have questions. Uh, they don't just jump right into things. And, you know, let's face it, some of them are nervous to, uh, to move forward. So it's great that you can do that for a free consultation. It's awesome. So we are going to close up the show today. And uh, as I said, all of our listeners go on out to harvestgrowth.com. All of this information will be available on our show notes page for Mr. John LeClaire. Um, I thank him for being on today. If I could ask our listeners, it would be awesome if you could go out to Google Play or iTunes, leave us a review, leave us an honest uh, ranking. It would be great. And uh, if you have a suggestion for a guest or a title for a show, please send it over to us. And again, I appreciate you listening today and we'll catch you next time on Eventers Launchpad Network. You all take care. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the Harvest Growth Podcast, where we seek to teach the latest strategies and trends to profitably grow your consumer product business. Be sure to check out harvestgrowthpodcast.com to see other episodes that we have recorded. And if you liked this episode and you want to learn more about how Harvest Growth can help your business, check out harvestgrowth.com and you can book an appointment with one of our product marketing specialists right from our homepage. If you'd like to hear more shows like this, please be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review at iTunes or Google Play.